Banksy, the acclaimed graffiti artist, has been quoted as saying that people say graffiti is ugly, irresponsible, and childish, but that's only if it's done properly. Graffiti definitely attracts attention, from both appreciative and disapproving viewers alike. Who hasn't seen phrases carved into a bathroom stall, or an obscene word painted in large, bright letters on the side of a derelict building? In antiquity, graffiti served a variety of purposes. Frank J. D'Angelo notes that the term graffiti, derived from the Latin graffiare, meaning to scratch, was used by archaeologists to describe the informal writings and drawings on the ancient buildings of Pompeii. He also states that artists use sharp instruments to carve into plaster and stone surfaces and charcoal and red chalk for smooth surfaces. In academia, graffiti examples are actually incredibly valuable resources. In fact, according to doctors Erica Dahmer and Rebecca Benefiel, the collection of ancient graffiti in Pompeii and Herculaneum is one of the three primary sources of handwritten documents from the period of classical antiquity, the other two being the papyri collections in Egypt and the wooden tablets near Hadrian's Wall in Britain. Let's consider the different varieties of graffiti found in the remains of ancient Rome, Pompeii, and Herculaneum. The graffiti known as commercial graffiti are those which provide evidence for commercial activity in a certain area. Larger amounts of graffiti in a given area indicate greater commercial activity in that area, and the graffiti may even provide insight into the relative levels of activity throughout the city. Common institutions in and around which these graffitis have been found are brothels and tabernets, which could have included shops, eating establishments, and bakeries. For instance, in the Bakery of Herculaneum in Insula 5 are distinct tally marks on the walls, and deeper into the house is a crude inscription of the complete Latin alphabet. Damer and Benefiel conclude that the tally marks may count sales that were made during the day, or a stock remaining, and that the alphabet in the back proves that the establishment was both a business and residence for the owners. Other examples of commercial graffiti include lists of food bought or sold, list of merchandise that the shop and eating establishment sold, or even what goods were available at certain times of the year, all of which provide modern scholars with better information on ancient prices and the overall economy. Another type of graffiti which is quite insightful for modern scholars is political graffiti. Peter Keegan notes that these graffiti give more information on the political opinions of all citizens, and offer further proof of, or even evidence against, what he terms the official consensus. Some noticeable political graffiti in Pompeii are the programmata, election notices painted in large letters on walls all over the city. A large number of these programmata appear along the Via della Bondanza, for example. To quote Christina Milnor, the programmata are the single best source we have for small town politics in the early empire. Keegan also describes how they follow a general formula, including the candidate's name, the position he's running for, and a verb or phrase entreating the viewer to vote for that person. He even states that over 50 programmata in Pompeii attest to the involvement of women in this political activity. These programmata, then, are quite useful in gaining an awareness of the political life in such ancient towns as Pompeii. Other common types of ancient graffiti, just like modern graffiti, are names and images. In the bathhouse of Herculaneum, for example, one can see the name of a woman etched into the wall in the ancient language of Oscan, which Keegan concludes is most likely the signature of a woman visiting the bathhouse and not a slave. There are also names written onto the walls of the Lupinar brothel in Pompeii. Graffiti artwork is especially interesting, for as Dahmer and Benefil assert, although people attempt to associate them with specific beliefs or myths, images in graffiti are likely just the result of the inscriber's personal interest at the time. For this reason, they conclude, one may discover phalluses in or near brothels, boats in port towns, as seen in the Stabian Baths of Pompeii, and small artistic drawings on wall paintings, such as the mandalas and flowers on a wall fresco in a Pompeian house. Some imagery is not altogether wholesome, however. Obscene images, as well as obscene phrases, are quite common amongst ancient graffiti and have multiple functions. Alison Cooley describes phallic imagery in graffiti as not only a symbol of sex, but also of fertility and prosperity. There are multiple types of obscene graffiti relating to such topics as religion, sex, and bodily waste. In Pompeian graffiti, as D'Angelo attests, the most common theme was love and sex. In fact, most of the information on sex in ancient Rome originates from the physical remains of brothels, and the brothel in Pompeii has mass amounts of graffiti which describe services available at the establishment. Women are alarmingly and crudely sexualized in these graffiti. All types of graffiti whether practical or obscene, whether ancient or modern, serve to express something to their viewers and therefore provide insight into their surrounding culture. 
Ancient graffiti are truly valuable resources for modern scholars as they indicate aspects of everyday life in antiquity.